Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is a little bit different than the cases that I normally cover. It's a case where we know what happened, we know allegedly why, but there are conflicting stories and conflicting information on whether certain claims are true. It's a case that I originally saw on social media and as a true crime researcher, I know that a lot of people can sensationalize a story and share the story as being super black and white without knowing the full story. So that's why I'm here doing this case today to break down the facts of this case to figure out what really happened. This is a case that I'm really looking forward to hearing everybody's thoughts and discussions on how this entire thing played out. But before we get into the video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Casetify. Casetify is a new sponsor here on this channel and I'm so, so excited because I was using the same old phone case for so long, it was literally falling apart. I would literally drop it and then have to put it back together. So I was in the market for a new phone case and case defy is definitely the way to go i wanted a really nice and slim phone case that really speaks to my own personality and style that isn't super bulky while also protecting my phone from my very clumsy self it's literally a running joke within my friend group that i literally fall all the time and i'm constantly dropping my phone so i need the absolute best and most protective phone case to keep my phone from breaking case defies ultra impact cases are the world's slimmest most protective phone cases out there they have g tech 2.0 technology that is drop tested for drops up to 9.8 feet no joke. I just went on a weekend trip to Colorado for snowboarding and before I even stepped foot on a snowboard, I literally slipped on the ice and my phone went flying and she survived. Also while snowboarding, I probably fell over 20 times with my phone in my pocket and then a few times with my phone in my hand as I was snowboarding because stupidly I was trying to record. I literally tore a ligament in my knee from my gnarly wipeouts and my phone survived all of it. Casetify also has so many different options for different colors and prints that can match your personality or even your mood. They have so many different designs including matte, sheer, and clear cases and ones where you can add your own unique touches through monograms. Right now I'm using this beautiful floral ultra impact case which I found on their website and was so set on getting it right away. I love this case. I've been complimented on it so many times by friends and coworkers. It is so beautiful. I also got this cute simple compost custom impact phone case with my dog Willie's name engraved on it because she is literally my life and I love having a little reminder of her when I'm at work or just away from home. I also got this really fun bright interactive custom case also with Willie's name on it. I love this phone case for when I'm just like sitting in the car bored of course while someone else is driving or just like waiting for an appointment or something because I love just watching the colors and doing their thing going back and forth it's honestly it can be mesmerizing. I also got my boyfriend this super cool space case. This totally speaks to his personality and he is obsessed with it. The other amazing thing about Case Defy is that their impact and ultra impact cases are made from 65% recycled and plant-based materials while being 5G compatible and compatible with wireless charging. Their materials are also 100% non-toxic and non-hazardous and they have an antimicrobial coating on them, which keeps your phone germ-free, killing 99% of bacteria. This is obviously so important for so many reasons, especially knowing how dirty your phone and your phone case can get. So if you want a stylish, protective phone case with personality, make sure you head over to casetify.com slash Rachel Shannon for 15% off of your order. That link also will be down in the description box below. Again, that is casetify.com slash Rachel Shannon for 15% off of your order. Order. Thank you again so much to Case Defy for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. I'm going to try my best to put this all together in a very understandable and digestible format. So first, we're gonna be going over all of the people involved in this case. So first, we have 60-year-old John Eisenman. Not a lot is known about his family, but we know that he's engaged to be married to a woman named Brenda Cross, and he has a 19-year-old daughter whose name has not been released for reasons that we will get into in just a minute. He also has a stepdaughter named Ashley Cross. Ashley is one of his biggest advocates, saying that John is an amazing man and an even better father. He goes above and beyond for his children, according to her, and throughout his life, he's never had any violent tendencies towards anyone for any reason. Brenda described him as as being a very selfless, giving, and loyal man. He is a stand-up citizen and a very hard worker, according to them, 
and at the time, John and his family were living in Spokane, Washington. At the time, John's 19-year-old daughter, who I will now just refer to as John's daughter or his daughter, was dating a man named Andrew Sorensen. According to his family, Andrew came into their family as a foster child when he was only six months old. He was born with cerebral palsy and autism and had been diagnosed with developmental delay when he was a child. His parents say that because of this, they were especially compassionate and loving towards him as he grew up, saying that he was extra special to them. Growing up, he had to go through a lot of physical therapy, occupational therapy, and speech therapy just to be able to get him to the point of moving like other kids and being able to keep up with his peers. Then as he grew a little bit older, his symptoms of autism began to show. They described him as a very sweet and affectionate child, but he didn't quite understand personal space. He had to be taught about personal boundaries and his family said that they had to teach him that he has to ask someone permission before he gives them a hug. However, by the 10th grade, Andrew started struggling with his mental health he started to notice that he wasn't like other teens his age and he constantly felt like he didn't fit in. He ended up requiring several stays at inpatient mental health facilities before his family actually had to go out of state to seek additional help. When he was 17 years old, he started to go to downtown Spokane to start hanging out with the homeless teens. His parents said that because of his autism, he sort of just felt like he fit in better with these other teens and he felt like these other teens accepted him. It got to the point where Andrew started bringing homeless people to his home to hang out there because he wanted to share what he had with them. At one point, his mother said that Andrew had five or six homeless teens living in his home and he was helping them out with things like getting their Medicaid card and helping them get to school and giving them food stamps and things like that. His parents said that they helped the teens too because they wanted every teenager or every kid to know that their home was a safe place and they wanted them to know that they were loved and cared for. When he was 17, Andrew graduated from an online high school, which was a huge accomplishment for him. However, by the time he was 18 years old, he started to smoke marijuana, which led him into getting into harder drugs, and from there, things just grew more and more difficult for him. Now, we will get more into the allegations against him in just a minute, but Andrew's family said that they've been advised by their lawyers not to talk a lot about Andrew in the media, so I do want to say right off the bat that we don't know Andrew's full story or his side of the story. However, we do know that he has a bit of a criminal record. In July of 2020, he pled not guilty to fourth degree assault charges, marijuana possession, and intent to sell marijuana. In April of 2019, a woman requested a temporary order of protection against him, but this was denied after a court hearing. So, once Andrew graduated high school, his parents said that he did start bringing home girls, one of which was John's daughter. Andrew's mom said that just like any of the other teens that he would bring home, he wanted to help this girl too. So the next timeline comes from Andrew's mom, Teresa's point of view. We will get more into the rest of the timeline from another point of view later in the video. But at one point, Andrew's mom reports that this girl, so John's daughter, got a $22,000 settlement money after a car crash that she was involved with. According to Andrew's mom, she encouraged this girl to use the money to make a better life for herself. I think at this point, she was under the impression that she was homeless. I don't know if she was, I haven't seen anywhere else that she was actually homeless, but according to Teresa, Andrew's mom, instead of using this money for good to make her life better, she used this money to go ahead and buy a new car, she bought a bunch of new clothes, she used this for drugs, and then she also funded a road trip up to Seattle. She said that Andrew, his girlfriend or John's daughter, and a couple of other people all hopped in this new car and went on a joyride. After this, Andrew's mom said that Andrew drove them up to Seattle and dropped them off at a 7-Eleven, so the girlfriend as well as two other acquaintances that they were with, and then he told them that he was going to return shortly. However, after this, according to Andrew's mom, he didn't return because the car actually got stolen. So it sounded like Andrew pulled over somewhere, went to go do something, and then while he was away from the car, somehow it got stolen. And when the car got stolen, his phone was inside of the car, so he had no way of contacting anybody. So at this point, Andrew was alone in Seattle without his phone, without the car, and without his girlfriend or his acquaintances. Eventually, after a few days, he was able to get into contact with his uncle who picked him up and drove him back to Spokane. At this time, 
time, according to his mom, Andrew had never really driven a car and he didn't have his license. They were all apparently using drugs as this was going on, which we will get more into later in the video. As all of this was going on with Andrew, John's daughter also found herself alone and stranded in Seattle. After being at the 7-Eleven store for quite some time, she walked over to a Chevron gas station and she called 911 to report that she was stranded. At the time, she'd been with two girls, so one of them was an underage girl who was taken to a nearby family's house. However, because she was an adult at the time, she was taken back to the 7-Eleven where the other adult acquaintance was waiting for her. Police left the two adult girls at the 7-Eleven and left but I will note that according to police documents, the girl was being uncooperative at one point. So I don't know if that means that they were trying to take her somewhere else and she just wouldn't go, or if she was just being uncooperative, so they left her there. I'm not exactly sure how that played out. After returning to Spokane, which more details we will get more into later, but after she returned, she ended up going to the hospital on October 23rd, 2020. Here, she made allegations of sexual assault. Apparently, a sexual assault kit was brought to the hospital, but for whatever reason, it was never completed. Three days later, after other reports, again, which we will get more into later, um, the staff said that she was threatening to kill Andrew as well as her own parents. Again, it's thought that because he left her in Seattle, she was very upset with him and was saying all of these things and she was just very upset. There were also other things that she alleged, which we will get more into in just a minute. So after Andrew returned home from all of this, he went home and celebrated Halloween with his family. Then the next day he got up in the morning of November 1st, 2020, and he had plans to meet up with a friend that day. Of course, his mom was really nervous after what had just happened the previous weekend with him being stranded in Seattle but he went anyways. All he took with him was a small backpack and then he left and went on his way. His parents said that he showed no intention of being away from home for an extended period of time. However, after this, his parents never saw or heard from him ever again. So by the end of that same day on November 1st, 2020, Andrew was reported missing by his parents after they failed to come home or contact them in any way. For almost an entire year, his family had no idea what happened to him. They searched for him tirelessly and hoped and prayed that he was okay. His mom said that he just had this feeling that he was out there and that he was okay, and she prayed day after day that he would soon return home. However, his family's biggest fears would come to fruition when his body was found on October 22nd, 2021. So residents in Northeast Spokane noticed a 1991 green Honda Accord parked in their neighborhood parked on East Everett Street for a couple of days. Now, it's not uncommon for people to just abandon cars in this area according to the residents, so for a few days, people simply didn't really pay attention to this car. However, one of the residents named Amber, as well as her boyfriend, started to notice that their dogs were particularly interested in one specific car. It would constantly go run over to the car and then sniff around. So her, her boyfriend, and another one of their friends went over to the car to rummage through it, as they said, and check it out. Immediately, they noticed a foul odor coming from the car. As they inspected it further, they saw that the ignition was dangling, so that made it obvious to them that this car had been stolen. They also noticed that the interior of the car was a mess with clothes and books thrown all around, and they saw that the car's battery was actually missing. So after this, they decided to pop the trunk to see what was inside, and in the trunk, they discovered a human body. They found a young man in the trunk with his wrists and ankles bound together with zip ties, his mouth was taped shut, and there were puncture wounds all over his clothing, which indicated that he had been stabbed numerous times. Of course, they called police who arrived shortly after, and when they arrived, they immediately noted that there was mold all over the interior of the car, and of course, they also immediately noted the awful smell coming from the trunk. Upon inspection, they discovered that this body did belong to Andrew Sorensen. After this discovery, police found out that the car was registered to Brenda Cross, John Eisenman's fiance. Before they officially opened up the trunk to see the body, they tried calling Brenda multiple times, but her phone was not accepting phone calls at the time. Then when police went over to Brenda's house to question her, John was the one who answered the door, and he told police 
police that their car had actually been stolen a year prior. But of course, they denied knowing anything about the body that was inside of the trunk. Because they didn't have anything connecting him to Andrew yet, police had no reason to suspect them, so they weren't arrested for anything. However, a few days later after this, John's neighbor called Crime Check with a tip saying that John had actually admitted to him that he had killed someone and then put the body in the trunk of a car. John said that the way he described this person's body inside of the trunk was information that had not been released yet, and it was information that only the culprit would know. So after this, on October 29th, 2021, John was arrested and charged with Andrew's murder. After interrogation, John did admit to killing Andrew, but the story that he told sparked so much national coverage, so much conversation, and so many allegations and rumors. John told police that in October of 2020, he learned that his daughter had been sold into a sex trafficking ring in the Seattle area. He received information regarding this, so he was able to go up to the area and rescue her and bring her back to Spokane. So with this, we know that it connects to what we said earlier about her going up to Seattle with her boyfriend, then abandoning her there and her not returning home for a couple of days. John said that he obtained further information that his daughter's boyfriend, Andrew Sorensen, was responsible for getting her into sex trafficking and that he was the one who was profiting off of it. As far as I've seen, I don't really know how John got the information to even go up to Seattle and rescue her or how this connection was made. But again, think back to her being brought to the hospital and then her having these allegations of sexual assault. John said that on November 1st, he was able to track Andrew down to a trailer park in Airway Heights, Washington. After tracking him down and finding him, he abducted Andrew by tying him up and then putting him in the trunk of his car. And then he killed Andrew by hitting him in the head with a cinder block and then stabbing him over and over again. After doing this, John drove the car with the body still in the trunk to a remote area in North Spokane County and then left it there for 11 months, again with his body still inside. After these 11 months, an unknown individual drove the car to where it would later be found on East Everett Avenue. According to police, they believe that this individual was not aware that there was a body in the trunk as they were driving the car. So clearly the narrative that John is telling is that he found out that his daughter is being sold into sex trafficking. So he finds the person that's responsible and he kills him. This is a story that you probably heard on social media. People are praising him, and his family even set up a crowdsourcing page called Give, Send, Go to help cover the legal expenses as he sits in prison and awaits his trial. His stepdaughter, who set up the page, wrote, quote, This father did the unthinkable for some of us to save this little girl from an unspeakable life that causes long-term scars and years of emotional damage. He did what most of us parents would do or think about doing in a situation like this. He does not belong in jail. Prior to this, he had no violent offenses. Many are calling him a hero. I would like to do all we can as a community to help him be a free man and have his day in court to defend his honor and the honor of his daughter. And his fiance, Brenda, doubles down saying that he's an amazing man and an even better father. She said that she's proud of John. She said, quote, it was something that a lot of men say that they would do for their daughter. Going on to say, John is a very selfless father, very giving, loving, and loyal. He is the best father I could have ever had for my children. I'm very proud of John and I'm blessed to have him in my life and I want him back home. However, there's always two sides to every story. Andrew's parents flatly deny the accusations against him, saying that he had an IQ of only 81 and that he doesn't even have the mental capacity to be involved in sex trafficking. They said that Andrew's the one at risk for being taken advantage of, not the one taking advantage of anyone else. So now let's get more into what the investigation found. So court documents say that John admitted that he was probably under the influence of meth when he killed Andrew and had been using meth almost daily up to the day of the murder. So that is definitely something that we want to keep in mind as we go through this. Then we find out more about the story of this road trip up to Seattle. Again, the previous timeline was given by Andrew's mother, who of course is defending him. What she said was decently accurate, but the investigation provides additional details. According to court documents, Andrew, John's daughter, and the other acquaintances were all using meth when they went on that road trip on October 20th, 2020. Each of them apparently had smoked it several times throughout the entire drive. 
Again, we know that Andrew dropped them off at a 7-Eleven, saying that he would be back, but that he never returned. We later find out that he didn't return, apparently, because the car was stolen. In a Facebook message that Andrew sent to his mom at about 12.45 p.m. on October 21st, he told his mom that he no longer had the car. His mom replied asking him where his girlfriend and his friend were. I'm not sure if there was a reply to this message, but by 8.21 p.m., his mom asked again if he had ever found his girlfriend, and he replied saying that he hadn't found her. Investigators found no further information that Andrew had met up with his girlfriend or any other friends after that point. Two days later, so October 23rd, the girlfriend tried calling Andrew at 9 p.m., but he didn't answer. Then she texted him at 9.20 p.m. the same day with multiple cuss words and expletives, asking him to give her her stuff back. Andrew didn't reply until 3.31 p.m. on October 24th, and in this message, he said, why all you do is run your mouth about me. There hasn't been any further communication with them as far as I've seen until November 21st when she texted Andrew, hey, but of course he didn't reply. So John would later tell police that him and Brenda went to Seattle to pick up the girlfriend on October 23rd, and then they spent most of the day in Seattle before returning home. John said his daughter was then taken to Sacred Heart Medical Center just before midnight on that same day. According to police documents, she told a staff member there that she went to Seattle with her boyfriend who then left her there stranded. She told this worker that later a guy came over to her and said that he could help her out, but instead of helping her, he took her, locked her up, gave her a bunch of drugs, and then sold her for sex. In this initial statement, she did not say who this person was who was trying to sell her for sex. Then, in a second statement that she made to a staff member at the hospital, she said that her boyfriend, Andrew, dropped her off in Seattle with the purpose of selling her for drugs. She then said that she was homeless in Seattle for three weeks and was trying to get home, but men were just passing her around. However, it is noted that this timeline isn't possible since we know that she left for this road trip on October 20th and then returned home on October 23rd. So this could be as innocent as a misspeak where she meant to say three days, but for whatever reason, she said three weeks, I have done the same thing or she could have purposely exaggerated this detail or made this detail up. By October 25th, a police officer arrived to the medical center to speak with her himself. A counselor at the medical center told the officer that this girl had recently gotten a $22,000 settlement and that the money had been deposited into a bank account which Andrew had access to. She told the counselor that her and Andrew had bought the car together before driving off on that road trip and him dropping her off at that 7-Eleven. She said that once they got there in Seattle, she gave Andrew her debit card to go ahead and withdraw whatever money that he wanted. He said that after he withdrew the money, that is when he left her alone at the store. She said that after this, she was picked up by someone that she believed Andrew knew. She went on to say that this man took her to an apartment and then forced her to smoke from a pipe before she was sexually assaulted and abused by multiple men. The counselor at the medical center told the officer that she was not interested in speaking with police and that she didn't want to get in trouble and she didn't want to get anybody else in trouble by speaking with police. Police have not been able to identify the man that she claims picked her up at the 7-Eleven. So to sort of put this entire thing together, it seems like Andrew left her at the 7-Eleven on the 20th, and then the next morning at 6.20 a.m., she called police from the Chevron station. After this, police took the minor to the nearby residence and then left her and another adult there. Then it seems like at some point, John's daughter and the other acquaintance that they were with parted ways for whatever reason. Then on October 21st, she was picked up by this unidentified man, was sexually abused, and then got out at some point, whether it was that day or the next day, but at some point, two days later, she was able to get into contact with her parents who picked her up on October 23rd. So that is the information that we know as of right now. However, according to police documents, they haven't found any digital evidence of the sex trafficking, such as text messages or anything else that proves these allegations, such as like social media messages or posts or anything like that. And again, his family has come out and adamantly said that he does not have the mental capacity to do something like this. So after doing the research and putting everything together to the best of my abilities, based off of what we know, this is a very, very difficult case. I'm always someone who refuses to go off of those clickbaity, catchy headlines. I really 
don't like it and I don't appreciate it when cases are spread all over social media with this big picture of the man who's accused of being a sex trafficker with absolutely no further information to go along with it. People will tweet out his picture and say a father kills man who sex trafficked his daughter with no more information. Of course, people are gonna go and praise John for what he did. This seems to be the noble thing. He saved his daughter from this vicious sex trafficker. I would support him too if that was as black and white as it was. But as you can see, this case isn't quite as simple as a lot of people make it seem. So breaking this down person by person, let's start with John. I personally believe that John wholeheartedly believes that his daughter was trafficked. I think he killed Andrew with the intention of getting revenge for the daughter that he knows was sexually abused. I think she told him that Andrew was the one who sold her into trafficking and of course he believes her because it's his daughter. I think that him being on meth at the time also speaks with his mental state. John has absolutely no previous criminal history, so I don't know if he had ever done meth before or if maybe he found out this information and started using meth to cope with everything. But either way, I think after finding this information out about the sexual abuse that his daughter had suffered, I think, again, because of his mental state and to deal with it, he was on meth. Then I think after he picked his daughter up from Seattle over the course of the next few days with a combination of drugs and him being very very upset I think the anger was just stewing under the surface and then he broke down and decided that he was going to do something and that he was going to get revenge again speaking as someone who does not have kids but I'm very protective over children I'm very protective over my loved ones it's definitely understandable that he would find this out and then he would want to do something himself. So he went and killed the man who he believes is responsible for sexually abusing his daughter. So that's what I think about that in relation to John. However, as we know, it hasn't been proven yet whether Andrew is actually involved in sex trafficking her. I will go off the bat and say I do believe this girl's story. I believe that she was sexually abused. I believe that she was kidnapped. I believe that she may have been drugged during this entire thing and maybe she lost track of time and that's where the three weeks came from. There are two days that she is completely unaccounted for in Seattle. She was stranded and for some reason she didn't contact her parents. She didn't bother to contact her family or come home for two days. I think that that shows that something was preventing her from getting home. But I don't know if Andrew is the one who's solely responsible. Again, there's no digital evidence proving that he sold her into sex trafficking. But let's look into a few reasons why I think it could be possible. First, I haven't seen any reports actually confirming that this car was stolen. The only articles that I can find mentioning this are him telling his mom that the car was stolen. I haven't seen police confirm this anywhere. I haven't seen the day that it was reported or if it ever was reported. I haven't seen if the car was recovered or any other information about this. So that is a little bit suspicious that the only people saying that the car was stolen is Andrew's mother. So I don't know if I personally believe the story that the car was stolen and that's why he couldn't get back to his girlfriend. If you know any more about this, if you've seen that it was confirmed or denied, please let me know. But for now, this is what I think about this. Editing Rachel here. So as I was editing, my gears were kind of turning and I kind of started thinking about things that I didn't previously think of when I was researching or recording this. So as we saw from the investigation, Andrew ended up texting the girl after after he came home a couple days later. So whether he messaged her on Facebook, like he messaged his mom, or if he was texting her, I'm not exactly sure, but in the article that I read, it said that he was texting her. So that means that he got his phone back. So did he get the car back? And why wasn't it returned to the girl? Or was it returned to the girl? I don't know. But the thing is, is his mom said that he left his phone in the car, and that is why he wasn't able to get into contact with her right away. So when did he get his phone back? That's a big question that I'm thinking about now and it kind of makes me believe the whole stolen car thing a little bit less. Also, according to what I read, Andrew seemed like he did not try very hard to find his girlfriend. Again, I know that he didn't have his phone at the time, but he was able to get into contact with his mom via Facebook, so why didn't he try to get into contact with her via Facebook? In fact, when he finally got back into communication with her, 
it seems like he was more upset than happy that she was found and was finally getting back into contact with him. Now, in the message, he basically just says, you need to stop talking about me and spreading rumors about me. That's kind of strange. I mean, it could be because she was already accusing him of doing these things to her, but it's his girlfriend and he didn't really seem concerned for her well-being at that point. Even beyond him actually messaging her or reaching out to her, According to what I saw with his messages with his mom, he still didn't seem that concerned to find her. I do think that his lack of concern for her sets off some red flags for me. It is completely possible that Andrew may have communicated with people face to face about trafficking her, or maybe he had a separate cell phone where he contacted people in place of just never found it. I don't think a lack of digital evidence means a lack of any evidence. I'm really looking forward to what comes out about people that police interview, if anybody else is able to corroborate her story. I also wonder what the other people that she was with have to say about this. I wonder if they even know who these people are. So given all of this information, I personally don't know what to think in terms of Andrew being involved in sex trafficking her. I am definitely an advocate of not accusing someone of something if they're not here to defend themselves. If there is no evidence right now of him trafficking her, I don't want to say for sure that he did it. But I'm also not just going to sit here and deny claims from a girl who clearly went through something traumatic. In terms of what I think about Andrew, I think that he has some serious allegations against him and it will be up to investigators to prove or disprove them. I will say obviously that his family knows him best, but of course, they're gonna be on his side no matter what. And I don't know what to take of his family using his disabilities as saying that that's the reason why he can't be involved in something like this. As I've stated before in other videos, I work very, very closely with people who have disabilities and they are capable of so much more than people give them credit for, in both good and bad ways. I interact with people all the time who just treat a person like a child because of their disability, when in reality they can think and act like an adult and they can do things for themselves and they're a lot smarter than people give them credit for. And that goes for parents too. As a healthcare professional who's worked a lot with people with disabilities, I've seen so many people who don't realize their child's potential because of their disability. I'm not bashing parents at all, I'm not bashing anybody here actually because there are a lot of stigmas and a lot of misinformation about people with disabilities, but that's one huge aspect of my job. It's to educate people regarding their child's disability. But I don't know Andrew, I don't know the spectrum of his disability, so obviously I can't say definitively whether he's capable of certain things. Again, his parents would know him best, but I will say as a general statement, disabled does not mean incapable or incompetent. Having a disability does not mean that you can't be successful, but it also doesn't mean that you can't be involved in crime. All disabilities are on a spectrum and there are people who can't take care of themselves, but clearly Andrew was at a point where he can at least function in society. He was able to graduate high school. I know that it was a special circumstance, but he was able to do it. He was able to go off and hang out with friends on his own. He was able to do certain things independently. So that tells me that he's on a higher functioning end of the disability spectrum. This is something that I could be on a soapbox on all day because this is something I'm very passionate about. And again, I don't know Andrew, but as a general statement, give people with disabilities more credit. They can do a lot more than what you think they can. But either way, going off of that, maybe somebody did take advantage of him and convinced him to participate in sex trafficking his girlfriend because he truly did not grasp the consequences or the seriousness of the situation. Maybe the drugs clouded his judgment. I don't know. I guess what I'm saying is, do I think that Andrew is this big evil mastermind coordinating this human trafficking ring? No. But do I think it's possible that he could get mixed up in it? Again, because he was on drugs, we know that. Yes, I think it's possible. He had connections to obtain and do meth. He was involved in other criminal activities. So I don't wanna sit here and say that he's not capable of being involved in this just because he has a disability. The other thing that I will say, because I wanna give credit to both sides, I wanna remain unbiased in every single case, is that maybe the girlfriend is wrong. Maybe she truly believed that Andrew is connected to her being taken and drugged and raped even if he wasn't. Maybe it was someone else that they knew or someone related to the drugs that they were on. It's absolutely possible that in her mind, 
Him leaving her at the 7-Eleven was his way of dropping her off and selling her. Again, it's absolutely possible that this was his intention and that this is what he did, but it's also possible that the entire story that his mom was saying is true, that he dropped her off with the intention of coming back, but then the car got stolen. Again, I don't know his reasons for dropping her off. I don't know why she couldn't just come with for whatever he was doing or why he couldn't just stay there and wait for her while she was doing whatever she needed to do at the 7-Eleven. I honestly don't know why, but I do think it's possible that this happened the way that his mom said it did. And then I just wanna address this because I know there will be comments about this, but maybe she was just really mad at Andrew for leaving her there, so she made up this story. I'm saying it now, but I personally don't think she made this up. There's really no reason to sit there and tell mental health professionals at a hospital a lie. There's really no reason to lie about this if you don't have an ulterior motive. In most cases, health professionals cannot release this personal information. I'm assuming they're only able to do this because her identity has been concealed or because it's a criminal investigation. But there's no way that she could have known that they would release this information. I personally think if she had an ulterior motive in saying this, that she would have told other people. She would have posted about it. She would have texted someone. She would have told other people in Andrew's life to get him criticized, maybe to get him in a little bit of trouble, but she wouldn't specifically tell her family and mental health care professionals. I don't think that she intended for him to be killed. I don't even know if she knew that he was killed until all of this came out. We saw that she texted him on November 21st when he was already deceased. So I personally don't think she even knew. I don't think she made this up. I think that something happened to her, whether Andrew is responsible or not. But for whatever reason, she does believe that he was involved. I think that that's what's happening here. I'm really looking forward to everything else that comes out about this case with the trial for John. I think we're gonna get a much better idea of what happened after police are able to investigate and then this gets brought to trial. Of course, as more information comes out, I will keep you all updated. Also, I will note that John's daughter's name has not been released because of the sex trafficking allegations and she has not come out to make a statement or any comments about this case. So if for whatever reason her name is released, I just ask that you please respect her privacy because she went through something absolutely horrific and terrifying and it's clear that she wants her privacy and she wants to stay hidden. My reason for making this video is basically to tell a story and give every side their fair shot. I try to go into every single case unbiased and I only form my opinions based on the facts that I'm able to obtain from what's available and that is how I ask that all of you go about your decisions and your discussions. But either way, knowing all of this information, I'm really looking forward to hearing what you think. Do you think that Andrew is involved for sex trafficking the girl or do you think someone else is at play and that this was all just some horrible misunderstanding? And beyond that, do you think that John is justified in killing Andrew or do you agree with killing someone for revenge in general? Whether or not John did this for justified reasons, John will be sent to prison. Even if everything that he said about Andrew is true, you can't just kill someone for revenge. It would have been different if John had caught him in the act of trafficking his daughter and then he was killed because that was the only way that John could get her out, but that's not what happened in this case. He will most likely be sent to prison and he will most likely have a long sentence whether this is all true or not. But still, I do want to hear your thoughts on this case in the comments below. But with that, that is all the information that I have on this case. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the details of this very sensationalized case. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put up new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Also, don't forget to share this video so everyone can hear the real details on this very sensationalized case. Don't forget to go ahead and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. And if you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.